you've tuned into Invisi Youth Chat Session, a video podcast series. Our episode starts right now. Here's your host, Dominique Vale. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, where you can check in for your dose of stigma-breaking, humor-filling, motivation-loving life hacks and empowering tips for all of the medically adultish people in your life. You know I'm Dominique Vale, founder of Invisi Youth Charity and the host of Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, and today is Season 5, Episode 68. And today's going to be a fun episode for me because not only do I get to have a guest who loves to talk about activism, but I get to have a guest who loves all things football, and I mean European football, guys. It's going to be the founder of the disability of the of the diabetes, excuse me, diabetes football community, a type one diabetes advocate and coach of the UK's first all type one diabetic football squad, Chris Bright. After being diagnosed as a child with type 1 diabetes, Chris worked with family and doctors to find ways to continue playing football and balancing this new part of his daily life. As he got older, um, Chris then joined the Wales Football International team and at the same time began exploring the diabetes community online. And that fusion of his love of football at living a life with type 1 diabetes and his firm belief of the power of community and sport really empowered Chris to then in 2017 start the diabetes football community. The aim is to support the needs of diabetics who also share the passion of football. And Chris is super passionate about tackling the stigmas associated with the diagnosis through the work of peer support, which is fantastic. He's even brought more awareness of education through schools in the UK, talking to kids about the journey and especially to other young men about this experience of living with a chronic illness and with the diabetes football community, all that it can bring. He coaches the UK's first all type one diabetes football squad, which is fantastic. And it's bringing such a deep understanding of community and teamwork and allows individuals to grow and strive for their own greatness, finding ways to balance their life with type 1 diabetes. And Chris really wants all of these young people that are playing football and beyond to just feel empowered with the life they're building. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, amazing to hear some of those things. I can't quite believe that those are some of the things that I've been up to, but really proud of all of those, um, those things that you listed off there. No, and it was it's fan it's such a fantastic and it's such a wide range of different things you've done professionally and then also with the diabetes football community really kind of fusing your two worlds together in such a creative way. So I'm excited to have different segments where we get to tap into all of the things that you are super passionate about. And as always, I love to remind you guys at the top of the show to um, subscribe. If you haven't already to Invisive Chat Sessions, you can do that during any of the next 55 minutes that you are listening or watching this podcast episode. So you can click that subscribe button on YouTube or on any audio podcast platform you're on. That will be super helpful to us. And then I will give you a little fun reminder at the end of the episode about something like that, too. So without further ado, we're going into our first segment. It is In an Ideal World. You know, this segment for us is about trying to improve society and eradicate those stigmas. Those are big boulders to push up the hill on our own. So with these segments, we are talking about how to build an ideal world, what it would look like for Chris and myself, especially when it comes to the topics of sport and community for young people living with chronic illness and disability. So obviously from reading out your work history, that fusion of what that happens with sport and community building is super important for you. So do you think there's a main reason that for young people, especially that are living with chronic illness and disability, that fusion works so well for their own personal empowerment? I think um, sport has a, has a big part to play in uh, the culture and society's views and perceptions on on quite a number of different things and I think when you cross that with chronic illness and um, essentially something which is challenging sometimes perceived quite negatively you can spin 
that difficulty of chronic illness into something positive when you cross it with sport when it's quite often so widely positively received and I think that's where the fusion for me began when I was seeing and growing up with advocates and athletes out there that were uh, sharing their views um, being able to cut through with their views and really make positive change and and really have an, an impact on activism that I saw as an opportunity to to gather people and and gather a community where we could we could come together and and hopefully make a positive imprint on on those living with diabetes but more widely than that hopefully on the on the chronic illness community and and use sport as a real tool to drive positive social change which is for those living with the condition but but also to to alter perceptions of those that are looking in at the condition and maybe don't understand it as well as as well as those that are, are living with it so um it's been a it's been a great fusion it's been one that i hoped would would work well and uh so far really pleased with, with what we've been able to do and uh the community's response and i hope that many many more people will will follow in the footsteps of, of what we've been up to yeah no i i really agree with that because coming from an athletic background if you will and that's what caused my own injury and subsequent illnesses as well there is there's something that you when you're unable to go back to the sport the way that you were there's there is a disconnect because it becomes such a identifier if you have an athletic background especially for those that are living with an illness or disability that might have developed later in life um and to then have to kind of shift either away from a sport you were so in touch with and the people that you were playing with in that community and then having to go in a different direction there's so much that the focus is on that you're unable to play the sport or you can't go back to exactly the way you used to play. And there's not a lot of public discussion of adaptive sports or trying to go into other forms of similar sports or trying different ways to still be active and reframe and get that community um, support in just a different way because it's your mind is so tracked that this is the way I was doing it. This is the way everyone else does it. And I wouldn't be able to get the same thing if I'm not doing it that way, which what what you're doing, you're really showcasing that there are so many ways to still, especially with in the UK football is such a, uh, we were talking about it the other day. It's such a phenomenon of asking how the weather is, ask how your team was doing, kind of a one-two connection. So to kind of put them together, it allows that conversation to continue. Um, and I was kind of, kind of going off of that. I know what we really focus off with InvisiYouth is more personal growth and finding techniques for your own development and empowerment to strive for that success in daily life. But those tools are then what we want you to then utilize to go into community support and find your own communities. So do you feel like, what do you think with community-based support that you're a part of, that it lets young people grow a bit differently than if they were doing just sort of personal development? What is sort of that next step that they get for themselves when they're surrounded by a community of people? I think it's um I think you use the the words there like finding your tribe and finding mm. your area. And I think it's that um that comfort in your own skin, especially for those that are, are living with with conditions and difference um to you know the wide wider society's views and perceptions and how and how they interact with the world. So the the finding your tribe and finding your your people um within a subset of um your condition i think is the most powerful part if once you found that it you gain confidence i've seen a number of people come in and alter things based on being widely accepted by those that they feel are actually really like them and i think one of the mm. the things i've learned the most is you can put people together that live with the same condition, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to have a positive impact immediately on their behavior because they might just feel that they're slightly different people and they don't just because they have the same condition doesn't mean they're automatically got things in common. So mm -hmm. 
the the whole piece about bringing people together through interest is really quite powerful on influencing behavior and as a result of using interest first we've seen that the connection that people feel then to their interest firstly we you know we don't go in heavily on the condition side of things but we go in with the the subtle nod towards diabetes to begin with you bring them in through football you give them an opportunity to play in a team through football as we've already said really powerful people in the uk especially Mm -hmm. actually pretty powerful across the world um in terms of its uh yeah the, the way that people perceive football um and then you you hook them in on that and then once you've hooked them in you can slowly and but surely kind of engage them on their condition and we've seen quite a number of people have behavior uh influenced by then the people that they actually feel are just like them so we've we and it varies on age and it varies on gender and it and it is it can be as influential as as somebody going to work in it uh, in their daily life as their family can be on their behavioral choices and and how they manage themselves we we've found that this community connection through interest has really delivered changes to the way people look after themselves and the way that they manage their condition in a way which I hoped when I started it would be achieved but actually seeing it and hearing it and uh, being repeated from not just a one person to to several sev- several people families uh, from different walks of life I think is just yeah it just really really exciting and I hope one day something that isn't just where we are at the moment in diabetes and football it moves wider than that to to maybe other conditions and uh, and other sports and interests yeah i love how you the phrasing that you use that it's interest over condition because that's a big thing with us being a non-illness specific charity and we work across illnesses and mental health and disability that there's so much that so many people will have in common and they then realize they have different diagnoses that there's friends of mine that I've met through the charity that also that we have similar even symptoms and side effects, but we have completely different diagnoses. So if we met only in support groups, if you will, with just our diagnosis, a lot of times that was always for myself personally and for so many young people that are young adults coming in that are doing that personal, that self-advocacy of wanting to connect with people that are in that group, they feel that disconnect and sometimes that hurdle early on that you were mentioning because they just don't, they might be able to kind of, as we'll say, they'll be able to kind of have that sympathetic moaning circle about doctor experiences or certain symptoms. But then beyond that, you're lacking that connection beyond what you deal with in your health. And that can become super challenging. So for, I loved that through what you're doing. And then also what we're able to do is really reminding people that your illness is part of your definition, but it's not the uh, the first part of it. It's just one, if you look in a dictionary, it's one of those like subset ABCDs underneath your definition. And that just kind of gives you the lens that you look at the rest of the world and interact with it, but it's not like the be all identifier. And like you said, even for different age groups, you work with some different age groups as well. And then working with the young men in your community versus the young women, those two teams would probably, even if it's in a co-ed setting, they're talking to each other about different things as well that we've even noticed because a lot of the young women in our community will even ask a lot of the guys in our community just totally different questions that then they ask one another or vice versa. So I would imagine you've gotten to see kind of all of that play out with the different squads you've been able to develop and meet with. Yeah, uh, we we brought them together. We we did a, uh, like a co-ed session, so a men's and women's session together. Um, you can see the questions that are posed between the two different genders. It is so similar and the the our idea really is that people are just looking to find their interest and then improve upon their interest especially their say say it was football you want to be able to enjoy it as much as possible you want to be able to play as well as you can so therefore when you come into that setting you're 
you're asking questions um, about the sport, how to get better at it, but you're also asking questions about how to manage your condition better to be able to enjoy it more. So there's less stress going into the environment, but also how you might manage it better to, if you were looking for performance, if you were trying to, to play at a high level. So you can see that in the conversations, you can see that in when people are talking about their technology, which diabetes technology <laughs> you using to manage your condition, uh, which insulin are you using? Um, it, this insulin works really well for me. It stops this. It, it works really well around football. People are just trying to troubleshoot around what actually means a lot to them, which is their interest first. And there are some some differences. Uh, we, we talked about it the other day, Dominique, around um, men. And I think opening up um, interest is something that is really needed to lean on for men. I think sometimes the chronic illness advocacy space it's brilliant to see, but there's 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 a lot of women in that space, which is amazing, and not too many men. So how do we how do we get them there? How do we get them to share their voice and speak more openly? Well, something like using their interest in football or sport, which is so positively viewed within male culture, mm -hmm. I think is a great way to get them to to firstly engage in their condition, to firstly even just talk about it with other men. But mm -hmm. then how do you, once you get them on that path, then how do you take them from just talking about it amongst other men to then advocacy? And this is where you, this is the start of that journey. And I hope we can continue to learn from it and which will, I think, promote more advocacy amongst men. Um, but it's equally, it's a similar path for, for women yeah, I just think culturally, maybe, <clears throat> and not for me to comment as a man, but maybe you can comment more on it, Dominique, <laughs> that maybe women just find that a little easier to talk amongst um, themselves and maybe advocate uh, a little easier about chronic illness. Yeah, I think the big thing that you even touched on is um, we'll always say in a weird way, you kind of have to open the door and sneak the guys in from the other side first. And then they're like, oh, OK, I can talk about it now. But you can't. Ju but jumping in on a place where they'll feel vulnerable initially, um, not to speak on the whole gender as a whole. Obviously, as you pointed out, I am female, so that doesn't lend me well to speaking about the male experience. But for women, where there's a lot of societal, even stereotype of leaning into your vulnerability and speaking about how you feel, and that's sort of ingrained in just watching, even just watching TV or seeing characters on shows, that's sort of the lean that they'll push in for females. And so you're naturally inclined to then be curious, ask questions, share about struggle. And then for men, that seems to be, well, only with the very close friends that you've built, that that circle of trust you've developed, those are the ones you can ask. But a lot of times, those are the friends who don't have an illness or disability. And there's only so much from an empathy or trying to connect com that they can do. So like you said, it's sort of knowing your micro communities, if you will, well, you can't always have a one size fits all friend group, family group. It's, there's a lot of things that even you're probably noticing too, that a lot of the young people coming into the football community that they might not, they might be able to then take in from getting to talk about parts of their diabetes with other young men. And then for them, they can then translate that into a different micro community of theirs with their coworkers or their friends from home. And they can then, like you said, sort of take those steps of subtle activism, as we call it, where they're kind of subtly more comfortable to to check their insulin levels in front of people or sh if they're wearing an Omnipod, they can maybe show it more instead of feeling like they might hide it if some do. And so you can see that they might see others doing it, feel comfortable to then try it in other communities for themselves. And I think that's the bigger step for them then to feel comfortable having those conversations or answering questions that friends might have been curious about, but just feel like, oh, well, if he hasn't brought it up to me, I don't want to bring it up to him or vice versa. Yeah, I think the the subtle activism is where we make those first steps with men. And I can see it amongst our community where they just come in and then all of a sudden you can see they're injecting in front of people for the first mm -hmm. time or 
they are um, maybe challenging people around them on some of their views or whether before they might have just said nothing. Now, because they feel part of something and they feel supported, they found the people that are like them with their interest. Um, they, f- they they feel that they've got some backing to be able to say what they think for the first time or um, talk about their condition more openly than they have before with people that may be close to them, but maybe not that like they're in a circle, that slightly outer circle, the ones that you, they interact with regularly, but not uh, the ones that you would speak to and open up to. So you see it in the diabetes football community. And then there's others that go even a step further and they, they get involved on social media and they go from never speaking about the condition to subtle activism through to full on advocate mode where they now share their glucose levels live on Instagram and Twitter and, and talk about it and, and show what they're doing with their diabetes. So I'm really proud that we play a part in that for men and women. And now we're doing it for parents and of children with, with type one diabetes as well. And giving them a space where they have that backing and that support, which allows them then to go into their everyday lives and, and, and feel more confident and feel more positive about what they're going through and what they're living with. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And it kind of, it ties in perfectly um, before we go into our next segment, because we we both said it, so I might as well bring it in on a third time, um, that we, as always mentioned to you guys, it'll pop up next to me as I'm talking, that we have our InvisiYouth charity shop, and inside of it, we have our subtle activism bracelets that we have, which I'm wearing two of ours now that you would be able to see. Um, they are our handmade color-blocked bracelets that are gender-neutral and adjustable that are four dollars able to sell world um, ship worldwide and a hundred percent of every sale goes directly towards funding and busy use programs and resources that we provide every month for free for teens and young adults living with chronic illness and disability we call them our subtle activist bracelets because we say it's like the starbucks cup sitting in that game of thrones scene that it sparks your interest and curiosity without being in your face activism so you can subtly be able to mention support of a nonprofit or the young adult chronic illness and disability space so we'll have the link to our Etsy shop below and you'll be able to see it on the screen if you're watching on YouTube and if you're able to buy one for yourself or someone you care about like we said it's basically like making a four dollar donation directly to the charity and you get a gift in return so if you can that'd be great thank you so much for that and now we are going into our next segment Illis Superlatives Illis Superlatives in this Illis superlatives, you know that living life with chronic illness or disability, you gain lots of different life experiences. So what better way to get to know our guest, Chris, than go through and try and pull out some superlatives of life? So something that you share a lot about on social media now um, is that you do you work with the um, JDRF in the UK and that you have the diabetes football community. So um, do you think that there, we always say that diabetes is one of those chronic illnesses that is so universally well known um, in media, in culture, and then within other circles. So do you think there's a way that diabetic advocacy is done successfully that other chronic illnesses or rare disease communities could kind of take after in the way that it's discussed in that advocacy space? I think what springs to mind is a couple of key things on this. So I think the numbers for a mm. start of people living with a condition has an impact on then the likely advocacy from people. So there's obviously a significant number of people that are impacted by by diabetes, whether that's um, type 1 or type 2. So I think that influences the likely uh, posts and um yeah influencers and and the numbers of people that want to to share about their condition so that that plays a role for sure i mean there's 5 million people in the uk living with a version of diabetes uh, about 400 to 500,000 living with type 1 that's quite a significant number for a chronic illness mm. um so that definitely ha- plays a part um 
not sure. I don't want to quote the numbers for the US or, or North America, but the numbers will be obviously a lot higher than that. So <laughs> it definitely plays a part in advocacy. Um, the other part, which I think is slightly more a, a challenging conversation around it, is that diabetes in the media is quite negative and the general headlines associated to diabetes is pretty poor um, for the most part. And as a result of that, I think people feel the need to then fight against that perception and really rise up in unity against the the, the wide perception of the word diabetes. Mm. It's certainly something which influenced my uh, desire to get involved in advocacy in my mid-20s because I'd felt a lot of those stereotypes and that stigma very, very widely as I grew up in, in many different circles. And the that is as a result of the media because mm-hmm. why else and how else do so many people in so many different circles get such a negative or poor perception or incorrect perception of, of the condition I live with if it isn't for the media perpetuating stigma and stereotype so I feel that that also plays a part in then the desire of the community to want to share and want to push especially when it's quite often associated to lifestyle Mm. which for people living with type 1 diabetes has absolutely no role in why somebody would be diagnosed with that. So it almost feels like you're wronged immediately and then you feel that you need to say something about that. Now, it's not even fully true of those living with type 2 diabetes. It's kind of like 50% of those with type 2, a lifestyle, potentially lifestyle-related cases. So the you're fighting against a perception which is under 50% of the overall cases, but it's the widely adopted perception of the condition. So... I think that's what I have learned from my interactions, my my own experience growing up, what I felt. And I always had a burning desire to want to right some of the wrongs and a bit of a chip on my shoulder, if you like, about mm-hmm. what I'd felt growing up and some of the comments, some of the perceptions. And I knew eventually I was going to speak about it and I was going to want to share. And it is really a fire that burns inside because of, feeling wronged by the yeah the 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 adopted perceptions of of so many people within society so yeah I think that would be where I would lean towards as a a, my the learnings of advocacy in, in the spaces that I operate in both working for the diabetes football community and some of the research that I've done on on um going through university and and also connection through the work that I do at JDRF in the UK. Yeah, and I think the way, the it's a similar experience, especially in the rare disease space, as you're working without the numbers of the population in that case. But then also your the overall sort of media perception is that chronic illness or disability is something you have to work against, fight through, and it's all of this conquer David versus Goliath sort of mentality that so many what i love with the diabetic community especially in their activism in the young adult spaces they do so much of it being in a way sort of 50 50 they're showcasing their life and then just showcasing the parts of that experience that their diabetes plays into it so it's this really healthy mix of the the two that even if it is um a more melancholy discussion or a more serious topic, there's still this level of just their daily experience being brought into it that makes people feel more comfortable to then watch because they don't feel like they're watching some sad movie at all times, which in the media perception, that's sort of what you're ingrained to think is, oh, there's a diagnosis. Oh, okay. And so it becomes this, let's drop it down um, into more of a sad, we need sad background music as my friends talking to me about their, their story. And especially with 
with diabetes, there's, like you said, there's so many even well-known celebrities that are attached to different organizations or have started their own or talk about them having this illness and really just showcasing that it's just part of their, part of their routine and how they might change or edit the way they go about certain days based on how they feel, but they're still well-rounded. And so that really does enable other young people to feel that they can also showcase against those stigmas and like the organization you've started and working with um it's that it makes then the support networks around them feel comfortable to then also be a part of that advocacy because they know their young person feels that kind of fire in them and i would imagine this is what i was going to ask as well is um what you were mentioning previously with getting to see so many of your young people in the football community really kind of strengthening their own self-identity by seeing others with diabetes around them and how others interact with it. Have you, do you feel like there's a best or a highlight moment, if you will, of getting to see somebody sort of playing football and then their diabetes sort of is starting to, if in a way, kind of take the driver's seat and how they've tackled that moment in a really empowered way of, okay, I need to kind of switch gears and now focus on my health versus me playing and how they kind of, how they've learned to balance that well without sort of leaning into just disappointment. Yeah. So I think I can, I I use this example and I I won't name Mm -hmm. the person, but um, somebody was involved in our community quite early on in our in our tenure if you like in our existence and um this person came in and they were using insulin that was something i was using about 15 years before so it was almost as though they'd almost not trusted or felt that the healthcare professionals kind of didn't have their best interests like their Mm. or didn't understand their life and how their life operated so therefore maybe didn't understand why they were sticking with it or their interests or, or what really connected with them so there wasn't that relationship and because there wasn't that relationship when they suggested changes positive changes for their condition that person found it difficult and, and actually didn't make changes and mm. stuck with what they knew so this this person got involved um came to a, a session came to a football session they played this played throughout and was probably having a few more hypos than they than everybody else so a few more low blood glucose levels occurrences than than most others um that was happening in their everyday life as well so they were finding that challenge as part of just jet every day mm. and then they came into contact with with the guys and started asking questions as, as you do you, the football come first but afterwards it was a little bit more oh you know I had my my experience today I was I was going low I was you know I couldn't quite get a grip of this and they were asking and then all of a sudden it came out that this person's insulin was like 15 years older than everybody else's um they were finger prick checking and essentially needed to update needed to change Mm. needed to to have a shift in how they managed and as a result of that one experience, within about two to three months, they changed all of their insulin. They'd got hold of the technology that was people were using, the the, the CGM or the continuous glucose monitor that people were wearing. And they changed their, almost everything about their care and, and what they did in such a sh- short space of time. Now, this person now is from that place, completely different outlook mm. of, of diabetes they're an advocate they never used to talk now they share their experiences online Uh, a very talented runner running running 5ks at 15 minutes so like running at national level competitions and and it was all as a result of an opportunity to talk through interest first engagement and then it, it shifted everything that they did about them how they managed their condition 
That's really that's really phenomenal. Like even that's such a great example of sort of teamwork at its finest in not just the sport term of teamwork, but just in general of that community kind of engagement and troubleshooting and giving them options to then perhaps go to their doctor more confidently and discuss things with. Do you think if you had to pick sort of like a term of how to describe sort of the young people coming into your football teams and sort of describing them, what would be sort of the term you would use to describe them? I think when they start, I would probably use the word intrigued because Mm. they're kind of coming in, not really getting it, not really understanding what this is it's a fusion of something i live with with a few with with something that i really really enjoy and i like or i'm good at so interesting it, it's, it's kind of they're intrigued yeah i would say that they're, they're not sure and then all of a sudden it clicks i think is a way i would i would describe it in this one term oh i like that and then even the last one i was going to ask here is do you what would be sort of a major skill set you feel that the footballers that have diabetes that you're working with that they really adapt to excel better than you would say other footballers in general that don't have to kind of work through that sort of finding adaptations with a health struggle what are they kind of skilled at differently or learn to do better i think it's mindset so there's a couple of things in mindset one is a determination drive because you have an awful lot of motivation when you're trying to overcome a chronic illness to be able to perform and then when you're participating with everyone around you not having a chronic illness that does Mm -hmm. drive you harder for a lot of people to want to to basically show the world that this isn't stopping me and even though you haven't got my condition I'm still going to be better I'm still going to be quicker I'm still going to still run past you so there's that drive in there. There's a fire. There's a deep fire in a lot of people. But also there's another really key thing. Because diabetes humbles you every single day, um, you you don't go through life not making mistakes. And your mistakes can be costly with diabetes. Mm. But because there are so many, you get quite good at accepting mistakes. And if you're good at accepting mistakes... Um, you're then very good when it comes to a sporting environment at going again, accept that mistake, learn from it, which you have to do a lot with uh, with our chronic illness, learn from what you did wrong, go again. And then you can put that into place, a new routine, a new change to then try something else. Accepting mistakes and, and learning from them is one of the really big elements of of, of successful sports people that – you you can't be a great athlete without being able to learn from mistakes and accepting them and, and coming back from failure. So I think I would say some of the best skills that you learn in type one, in the type one diabetes world it, it is around mindset. And, and those are right up there. Yeah, that's a really, per- really perfect way of phrasing it, because that is something we'll always say, too, is you're always in the car driving in your life with a health struggle, but sometimes you have to be the passenger and sometimes you're in charge and being able to still feel confident depending on which role you're being um, allows you to really manifest that in so many different ways of living. Like you said, that mindset really translates onto the pitch and in so many other areas of life because you're able to just work through a mistake real quickly because you're like oh I'm, I'm used to adapting really quickly so okay that didn't work let's find something else because you have to do that naturally so that's sort of a skill set you're forced to learn where other people sometimes will ignore learning that skill for themselves which I think is is a benefit for young people like you said and then going before we go into our second half of the show and go into everyone's favorite segment you all know what's coming up soon i just always like to thank everybody for tuning into the invasive chat sessions you've made it halfway and as i'm giving you this little spiel if you would like to hit that subscribe button write a positive comment we always appreciate it but as always we do pop up our donate link you'll see it on the screen it's in the description and show notes because 100 percent of our donations go towards funding all of our free resources and programs we provide each month that are 
designated to empower teens and young adults living with chronic illness and disability in the eight countries we get to tap into to be empowered and have the resources so that they can develop and thrive in the lane of success and joy that they want for themselves. So if you're able to make a donation of any amount, big or small, that matters um, so much to us and helps us keep this Invisible Chat Sessions going. So we appreciate it a lot. Now, guys, it is everyone's favorite time of the show. It's So That One Time. So That One Time. Chris, this is where I get to sit back and drink some coffee and you get to tell all of us a story. So the mic is officially yours. So I was thinking of a story which I think probably demonstrates the challenges of type 1 diabetes management probably demonstrates the the views of society and and almost like the shock almost at the same time um of what it takes um and also in a moment where you really don't want it to to play up but it did play up in a really big way in terms of living with chronic illness so it shows that um even if you're kind of maybe somebody who's experienced or living with things for a long time things can still catch you out and go wrong so um this story was from um so i i when i was playing for the the national futsal team in in wales we were we jetted out to ireland so the republic of ireland to play in the the home nations internationals we were uh, so playing against England, Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. And um, we were away for a few days. So we would go on to camp for three, four or five days at a time. We were playing sort of three or four games across those days. And when you move to a different location with different foods and different routines, things can start to be a bit more challenging for, for somebody who's uh built their routine up learned how to manage their condition to tackle certain things in their life around the foods that they normally consume or the things that they normally would um interact with so we've got we're in a a hotel uh prior to one of the games and we were eating if you like pasta so pasta high carbohydrate food uh no real indication of how much carbohydrate was in this food uh or in the sauce that was attached to it um and i'm obviously aiming for a particular blood glucose level to try and help me play well mm. in a game of any kind of sport so this is our pre-match meal so it's about 3 to 4 hours before we leave um before we play the game we haven't left the hotel i'm eating this food i think I've got the right amount of insulin for the amount of carbohydrate. So I think being the really <laughs> obvious word here, because I hadn't, I really, really hadn't. And your levels are supposed to be uh, blood glucose levels. For, so this will be a British number. So it might need converting. I think you times it by 18 to convert it into the American mm-hmm. and North American number. So my aim was to be about six or seven to play the game. I ended up going two hours before kickoff, two and a half hours before kickoff to 22. Um, oh, bear, Lord. Bearing in mind, I had a, I was due to play a national team game. Oh, gosh. Uh, live on the TV. It was on the BBC. Um, and I was 22 about two and a half hours before kickoff. So, as you can imagine, I felt awful. I went into hospital as an eight-year-old when I was diagnosed and I was 25. So I wasn't that far off the numbers of when I was diagnosed. So I was basically injecting for, I reckon I did about five or six injections of insulin in about an hour and a half to try and get these levels into a place where I was even semi-okay to try and play or be involved. So the pressure's on anyway, right? So I'm I'm obviously playing uh, at like a trying to play at a high level game for the national team, and my level was level was 22. I get to the the venue, so as you can imagine, there's panic all over my face. I'm 
literally worried sick that I'm basically not going to be able to play this game and and I hadn't played for nearly two years for the national team. I'd been out for a re- with a really bad injury and I was so annoyed because I thought this is a really big opportunity. Mm. I'm getting to play today. I knew I was in the squad. I knew I was going to get an opportunity to play. And my diabetes had literally fallen down around me. It was a absolute shambles. So I turn up to the to the venue. I'm injecting so, I don't know, maybe two or three times at the venue. I get out onto the court, uh, I do a warm-up, probably my worst warm-up of my entire playing days. It's just, oh. I was, I could barely run, I could barely move the ball around. I was, I felt horrific. Um, I came back in from the warm-up and I was just praying that things had dropped and it had dropped to about 14, 13. So we're starting to get into a range where I'm like, come on keep coming keep coming at (laughs) at this point I'm getting close to it but I injected again in the changing room and it was one of the one of the one of the lads turned to me and said you are you all right you've done that loads recently and he said how many times you have to do that a day and I said I said as many as it takes and he was Mm -hmm. like as many as it takes I said yeah today I'm probably going to have done this to try and get this into range for me to play, I would have probably finished today on about 12 injections, maybe wow. more. And he was like, I, I, he, he was in shock. He just didn't, he just didn't know what to say or do. And when you, when you're surrounded by your teammates and they're like, wow, in that moment, I hope in some ways it kind of, you know, might have provided a bit of a grounding to say, you know, at least you haven't got to do this to try and get out <laughs> on the court. So the 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 long and the short of it in the end was that I got the level down to about 11 mm. and 11 is getting on to being just about okay to play I mean I would ideally want it just under 10 but I was starting to feel a bit better and I did play I did get a few minutes I did get on the court I did fine I did well in the time I had on and the levels just about made it in time for me to be able to play but I have probably never been so concerned and almost at the point where you're at a glucose level, which could put you in hospital to then two hours later, you're just Mm. about at a level and you're playing a national team sport game. It it just, that's the, the, yeah, the, the complete contrast in experiences that you can have as somebody living with type one, one minute, you're literally, not far off being in hospital and then the next minute you're running out onto court to play play for the national team in a game it just it baff it's baffling sometimes the condition but that was an experience that I had in 2018 which I think had it all in it it had it all (laughs) Very true. It's, it shows that chronic illness is spontaneity at its finest, <laughs> for sure. Um, I, 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 that was a really great story. I liked that a lot. Um, not that you went through the experience, but the over, it <laughs> yeah. ended well. <laughs> yeah, we got there in the end. It was a positive yeah. ending. Always good, good to ending. have a positive ending to a story. I love that. Uh, and we're going to go, something that you can see that is true to Chris's character is the definition of our final segment. It is Rebel Game Changer Status. Rebel Game Changer Status. You guys know Rebel Game Changer Status is a segment that I love a lot. And with Chris, we are going to be going through some quick ways and situations that young people can make waves in their own activism personally, in their own community, and at large. So kind of this is a bit of a twofold question that I was going to ask, but from working with yourself, growing with having type 1 diabetes, and then working with so many young adults in the football space that live with type 1 diabetes, have you noticed that there is a combination that makes the young adult space and living with a chronic illness, that combination more unique or an added layer of stress to it versus being very young or being in adulthood? I think it's that fitting in phase where Mm -hmm. teenagers and young adults especially are trying to find their way and who they are and their identity in life. And I think my personal experiences, I've seen that challenging um, as a young adult. 
but also I've seen that a number of times with experiences that have been shared with me that young people, that teenage space, they find it challenging to fit in with the people that are around them, the mainstream society whilst living with a condition and it can cause challenges with managing something like the type one, which is why it's important to find your your tribe, find those people that really are like you, really have your interests and live with your condition because it can be that thing that helps keep you on the straight and narrow. Yeah, it's it's sort of the first time they get a taste of independence and then that and knowing what sort of the consequences of their choices are. But then now the idea of independence and choice kind of gets taken because you now have medical professionals intervening or needing assistance. So that version of independence kind of alters a bit. So it becomes like, like you said, that finding your own path, you now have people on the path with you as, as you're doing it. Um, And then kind of the second part of that question is what would be kind of a piece of advice that you would give to other teens and young adults that are trying to be empowered to manage their health conditions or their disability with those stressors that they might be feeling at the same time? Um, I think it's to try and talk to those that are around you and be open with the people that are around you. Um, but also find the thing that's really important to you in life. And and I, that the thing that really helped me was that I linked my ability or what I wanted to do in life to needing to look after myself and actually mm. looking after myself really played into the things that were important to me in life so even just thinking um, I want to be able to enjoy and play my play as much football as I can it's no there's no pressure in performance there's no anything like that it's just I want to be able to enjoy it and I want to be able to play as much as I can Mm. but to be able to play as much as I can I need to ensure my condition is is looked after as as best as I can and um, having that those subtle links to well-being really well-being and what's important to you I think really helps in the motivation to to stay on track when it becomes hard or when uh, other factors come into play but also then talking to to those that really know you and are around you and, and having those open chats, I think also really will help. Yeah. And and a big point that you kind of mentioned too, is all of that is sort of your own personal decisions of your own, and you're not doing the comparison, which we always say is the big, the big no, no, If you start looking to friends with health conditions, similar, or your friends who are quote unquote healthy and non-disabled, that's sort of the the be all end all if you start doing that comparison game it becomes challenging for you to manage your own expectations or stressors because you're just going to be on a you'll still get to the end goal that's the same we'll say but your journey will be taking different roads than theirs will and that will feel hard if you start to compare well I have to do these different things to get to the same end goal that they do that doesn't really matter if you're getting to the same result so like you said, kind of keeping that mindset of that link, I like that you said that between what's going to make me do the best for my health and then what do I want to do? And if I can put them together, that does make a really good combination for someone's success. And then another thing I was going to ask too is something that I've experienced. We have so many other young people um, and I imagine a lot of the young people who are coming and going back to football perhaps for the first time after a diagnosis is that kind of worry that even family members might have of I'm worried about them going into a sport or doing a new activity that might challenge their health. Um, And so that can become like a personal worry of, am I going to push my body too much? And then you become stagnant and not doing anything. So what's kind of that piece of advice you give to people that either are wanting to get back into a sport they or an activity they did prior to an illness or diagnosis um, and try to move past that hurdle of that worry of the what ifs. Yeah, um, I think it's about preparation, really, and and routine and experiential learning. Um, you are going to face challenges doing the things that you want to do now with living with a chronic illness, but trying to see those difficulties and those challenges that you face as like a bad pass rather than anything more dramatic or anything more Mm. um, detrimental than that. If you see it as like a bad pass, you wouldn't give up on things or do it 
uh, or not do football again because you made one bad pass. You would kind of learn from that bad pass and I'll play it a bit harder next time or, or whatever it looks like. But it, with chronic illness or with type one, that's kind of been, that's kind of going to happen. You, you're you not going to go, I don't think, especially with our condition, you're not going to be able to experience physical activity and never have a challenge again with blood glucose levels because they go they go hand in hand. It's like an it's physical activity impacts on blood glucose levels. So you're never gonna. I don't think that's ever possible. But trying to diminish the res, the, the the mistakes weight in your view of tackling sport. So trying to take some pressure off. If it does go wrong with your condition, it's just a bad pass. I'll learn from it. I'll go again. And if you do that alongside preparation, so if you do that alongside having your whatever it is for your chronic illness that you need around you, for us in type one, it's your insulin, your blood glucose meter, having enough um, glucose around you or fast acting glucose, whether that's drinks or, or sugary mm. sweets, whatever it may be, to to boost levels. You're never going to be too far off being able to make adjustments to allow you to continue and that once you've gone through it once you've been out there you've done it you've tried it and you've enjoyed it and maybe even tackled it with somebody else living with diabetes if you're lucky enough to be able to know somebody at that very early stage or uh, somebody else with a similar chronic illness it will help just build some confidence about the next time preparation seeing mistakes as as just a little bad pass yeah, I like that. It's sort of knowing, providing yourself the safety nets around you or allowing the coaches or people that are in charge to just know, hey, can you look out for these things? It's you're giving yourself those little safety nets um, that and then also, like you said, be being realistic of I'm not going to try and go in and become the best out of the gate and just totally I always will say you're in charge of your own body. You you know your own health and how you react to things. So you start to learn how to read your body signals, if you will, um, quickly. And then being able to be confident enough to listen to those signals over, I just want the rest of the team to do well. So I'm just going to keep pushing. Well, you're a priority to the team, like you said. So to be there for the next match, you need to prioritize if you need to take a step back in a certain moment. And so, like you said, that's a really valuable tool to kind of have all of those put together. Absolutely. And then the last question I was going to ask um, before we end the show was, do you think um, for new people trying to get into a community, whether that's virtually or in person, like you have with football, what would be that they're nervous about getting into a level of more public activism or a public understanding of their their health experience? What would be that piece of advice to help them kind of move past that self-consciousness? I think the, the starting place is actually just to watch. Um mm-hmm. I think just to look at somebody's social media, just to follow them or follow an account you're intrigued in that might be something you would like to potentially get involved in. Nobody's going to know what you're doing. You can watch from afar. You can look at people's content, whether that's on videos or whether that's on blogs or websites or, I don't know, Twitter, or whatever it looks like, whatever it means or, or looks like wherever you are operating or wanting to view it. I think just go there first, watch, look, see if it resonates. If it doesn't, you can find somebody else, something else and go and have another look. But that watching at the start is how you build an affinity to somebody or or something mm. or some community. So I think watch content, look at look out for people that could be on your vibe, that look look like how you operate or are in the same space as you operate in. And then just gradually, if you feel that you've built an affinity towards it, dropping a a dm on any social media platform is not that challenging or difficult and also the people you're dropping them to if it's about a condition everybody is so welcoming everybody Mm. is so up for helping just to to not feel that they're not going to get back to you i would guarantee that most people get back to you around in in a chronic illness space and if you find somebody or some organization you resonate with watch it build your affinity and if it feels right jump in drop them a dm drop them an email and you'll be away and before you know it you might find that find that thing that really helps you for the rest of your life or 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 for for certainly a large part of it 
that's that's perfect that's perfect advice to end the episode on chris and i want to thank you so much for being on the episode and speaking of social media where can people find you and the diabetes football community on online or when they're in the uk so um it's www.thediabetesfootballcommunity.com is the website um jdrf.org.uk is the charity i work for um then we've got um myself on social media so i'm on tiktok instagram and twitter on uh at chris brighty so that's at chris bright with a y on the end and then the number one um and there's yeah that's my the key places that i'm interacting Perfect. And we're going to have all of that in the description in the show notes, guys. So you can check out Chris has lots of football videos. So you know that I'm always checking those out and having the charity like them on Instagram for sure. So you guys can check those out and give him a follow. And also you can always find Invisi Youth at Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Invisi Youth and the Invisi Youth chat sessions where all audio podcast platforms are. So thank you guys so much for watching or listening to this episode. Thank you again, Chris, for being our guest for today. And I will speak with all of you soon. Bye, everybody.